Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service in beautiful Hernando County. And joining me today is my regular co-host, Lily Browning, who is our county's Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator, correct? Program Coordinator. Program Coordinator. I coordinate the program. I don't go out and coordinate the landscapes, but... <laughs> okay, so she won't come by and do your landscape, but she can uh, give you ideas and advice on how to have a beautiful landscape. Mm -hmm. And joining us again today is one of our Master Gardener volunteers, Bernie. Good morning, Bernie. How are you? I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much. We're glad to have you here also. And for anybody watching this in Hernando County, Bernie is here pretty much every Thursday unless there's a holiday, Christmas, New Year's, something like that, or an emergency comes up. But he's here pretty much every Thursday. And if you ever have any lawn and garden questions, um, you want to email pictures of a question or problem you're having, Bernie's here every Thursday for you to come by and ask questions of in person. And he likes answering questions. He does, yes. He doesn't want to sit there all day. Um, he entertains himself but he'd rather you come in and <laughs> ask questions. So. Good morning, Monique. Here, let me go ahead and toss our phone number up there if you'd ever like to contact our office. If you call that phone number today, you'll get a hold of Teresa and she can patch you through to Bernie to answer your question. So I would good morning, like to Monique. have some citrus questions. It Used to be the, the number one questions were citrus, and I was pretty good at those. And now the number one thing, obviously, is lawns because everybody moves here from up north and expects to grow grass and finds out that that's not what's going to happen. So <laughs> I, I talk about grass every day, every day, every day. But citrus uh, is kind of getting ignored, and, and it's dying out in Florida, and it's a shame. So. Let's talk citrus. How about that? All right. Is that what Bernology sure. is that what Bernology is going to be today? No, Bernology today is going to be about Kogan grass. Okay. Okay. Well, if we're going to talk citrus, tell you mentioned it's dying out. So if I wanted to plant a citrus some type of citrus plant in my yard this weekend, what are you going to tell me to plant? Well, that, that's an interesting thing. I'm going to tell you to plant the cheapest citrus tree you can buy. I'll do that. Uh, no, there, there's a, a, a variety called Sugar Bell, which is pretty much uh, a tangerine type thing. Uh, very sweet orange. Uh, and it is, it, it gets citrus greening, but it, it goes ahead and produces sweet fruit, where most of the citrus, when it gets the greening, uh, produces sour fruit. So uh, my recommendation, by the way, on greening is just let the plants go until the fruit's not good and then get rid of them. But uh, at this point, you're not worried about providing uh, uh, a, an infected plant that uh, is going to move to your neighbors. Their plants are already infected. So uh, pretty much plant on any citrus put, tree that you put in will be infected. Uh, so what key is limes citrus? And put them in a pot works really great. And key limes will produce, you know, 10 months out of the year. Uh, you can take your Corona and stick a little key lime in it. It's just as good as if you had big lime. <laughs> and uh, it promotes the sale of Corona, which right now, Anheuser Bush needs it. There, there's a little slow. Um, the uh, other citrus, the oranges and those kind of things, uh, as a general rule, uh, you'll probably get about five or six years uh, before greening overtakes them and, and they quit doing you any good. So what uh, is greening? If, you know, if you're not spending a lot of money, you know, just about any of the citrus uh, works pretty good now. The, the disease doesn't spread quite as fast because most of the citrus is gone. Uh, the, the little bugs are having trouble finding things to infect. So what is greening? Greening is a disease, uh, I believe it's from China. The actual name is Hong Long Bing. It's a uh, Chinese name. 
and uh, stands for yellow dragon it's because they, they get yellow stripes in the in the uh, plant uh, it, it's a uh, bacteria that is spread by uh, a little thing called a citrus a very very small insect you almost need a hand lens to see them uh, very very common uh, the the insect was here uh, to spread the, the disease, it's, it's called vectoring it. The vector was already here. As soon as the disease showed up, uh, boom, uh, it, it spread really quick because everything was already in place. Well, that's mm -hmm. one. The, the disease reasons. triangle existed. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The 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 fruit was very susceptible. Uh, the disease was very virulent, and the uh, transmission agent was there and ready to go so that, that's why it's such a problem if, if you want to take fruit to california uh they, they practically uh, throw you off an airplane if you get on a plane with an orange now they they do not want anything showing up out there that's going to end their production they have the cellets they have the trees all they need is is for some of our uh greening disease to pathogens get there. And it's yeah. going to spread their area like wildfire. Hmm. So how did it get here? Probably somebody brought an orange in on an airplane. And, uh, These things get, get around. around. Yeah, they, they, you know, we, we get, what, uh, every two months an, another nasty problem, uh, either uh, plant disease or insect that, that shows up. Uh, and they do their best to catch it, but when you're importing tons and tons and tons of things, uh, it's very difficult to check every one of them down to the, uh, not microscopic level, but at least down to the level where you can see small insects. And, uh, you know, so we, we've uh, had some things go through the uh, ambrosia beetle taking all the red bay trees. Uh, that, that was one where you could actually see uh, how fast it moved. Um, one year it was in Citrus County and all the red bays were dead. And then the next year uh, it was in Northern uh, Hernando County. And then it was in Central Hernando County. And then boom, it's down in Pasco County and it swept through Pasco County. And, and it did it. You could actually see the line moving. And, and it was really sad because most people didn't even know what a red bay tree that's was. what i was going to say the general yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't really notice them until they're all dead yeah, yeah the general the, public doesn't drive around thinking there's a red bay there's a red bay there's a red bay then suddenly they're like what are all those trees dead in the woods that's how they you know knew mm -hmm. them. Yeah, there, there get was a, an area near me that uh, had a lot of red bays uh, probably uh 20 percent of the trees in this forested area of, of three or four square miles were red bays. I had never noticed they were there, but boy, when they died, uh, it, it was just amazing. All the, all the red along the, the streets and uh, it, it was kind of a shame. And, and now those trees are, are pretty well gone. And the little insect is, is trying to find something to uh, keep going. And uh, they've moved into avocado trees. So the, this disease of citrus isn't really all that uh, rare. I mean, if, if you're an avocado farmer, it's now that is your problem. But the, the citrus thing is, is uh, become so bad, we're going to have the worst citrus crop this year that we've had in 100 years. So uh, gives you an idea of, of what the devastation is. And when when I started doing this, they were uh, concerned with with several of the citrus diseases. We had some state quarantines. Uh, you couldn't mm -hmm. move the, the citrus, and uh, they were attempting to to hold the diseases in the south. Yeah, fruit flies. There, the Mediterranean fruit flies. They, yeah. yeah, and the, the group of hurricanes came through and and spread everything throughout the state, and and pretty well solve that problem you know a lot of these diseases don't really stop the fruit from being good they stop it from being pretty but but greening 
stops the tree from being able to produce. It, it uh, destroys its ability to move sugars around. Uh, and when you can't do that, the, the, the tree can't feed itself. It, uh, the fruit becomes misshapen. The fruit becomes bitter. So uh, if, if you have problems with the, the fruit looking uh, misshapen and, or tasting awful, then you've got greening. And, and greening is pretty easy to diagnose. If, if you look at the leaves on the tree, the, the leaves, if you have a nutritional problem, will have a yellow spot, but the yellow spot will be centered equally on both sides of the mid vein of the leaf. Whereas with greening, there'll be splotches at different places on the leaves and there's no symmetry. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the symmetry is, is what you look for to, to see if you've already got greening and uh, most people do have it. It, uh, it it doesn't always kill the tree really quick you may, you may get three or four or five years out of the tree before it finally goes uh, if, if you fertilize it give it really good care you can keep it going a little longer but eventually the, the tree is so weakened it, it any stress at all and it just goes ahead and dies but uh, my, like I say, my recommendation, although this may not correspond with the university, is to just go ahead and, and keep the plant going until the fruit's bad. When when you no longer can get good fruit, boy, what do you want to plant? So, so get it and realizing it's going to be a short-term thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Tree's going to decline. It's going to lose leaves. It's going to look terrible. It's going to stop flowering and giving you any fruit or the fruit's going to be misshapen or taste terrible. So when they get it, they start declining downhill, sometimes faster, sometimes longer. Does it affect the wild citrus thing? Well, yeah. it does. It affects yeah. every citrus. And and the, the citrus that's wild out in the, the forest, to the places where they, they cut down uh, the citrus trees in the 80s, and put in pine forest, and and there's a few trees in in those pine forests. Those trees uh, tend to uh, get missed by the insect. You, if you're an insect and you're flying along looking for a tree, if you're flying over a pine forest, you don't notice the citrus that's growing underneath the pines. Oh, but, so uh, there's your answer. Mm -hmm. Fill up your yard with pine trees. Well, fill up and your yard. You, you need a really big cover, and of course. <laughs> You know, you're not going to get as much citrus because the, the trees aren't going to get the sunlight. Right. So maybe if I'm... you had just a slight opening. You know, none of these things have, have, have proven truly satisfactory. They, they've they had things where they tended the trees and, and mm -hmm. uh, put hot steam in it to uh, kill bacteria. That kind of works. It, it slows things down. If, if you fertilize it, you can slow things down. Uh, the, the economics of it are, uh, for no more than you could sell an orange for, it costs you almost that much to maintain the tree. So that, that's why I'm, I'm saying, if, if you can buy a, a, an orange tree and it's 15 or $20, you know, that who, who minds losing 15 or $20? But we got these people that are going out and spending uh, two hundred and fifty dollars for a, a eight foot tree, and uh, th that tree has has got n almost no chance of, of surviving four or five years. Well, uh, why why spend a lot of money counting it as part of your landscaping, and then have it uh, disappear right away? That that just doesn't make sense. Same way with with some of the the uh, palms, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. it, don't don't spend uh six or seven thousand dollars for a gorgeous fantastic landscaping palm if it's one of the palms that uh, has the disease problems well it's the same way there's a bunch now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so we we do have a lot of plant diseases in florida and and so many people make the mistake of buying something on impulse you you're at a yeah. store or a nursery and and here's this fantastically beautiful tree it would just be perfect right there in front of your house you buy it 
you get it planted and then maybe it's got a disease maybe it doesn't have a nice healthy habit it it ends up it, it trashes your yard with with something it, it produces spikes that fall on the ground and get <laughs> children or uh, the, the tree gets to be 180 feet tall and then falls over on your house. You know, a, a little education before you, you actually part with money would uh, be very, very wise. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful part about it is our university makes it possible to get that information super easy. If, if you want to buy an XYZ, if you, if you Google XYZ US, for the University of Florida. Uh, if there's any publication, that'll be at the top of the things that come back. And, and uh, because the University of Florida is there to protect the, the homeowners, the information you get will be very, very accurate. They aren't trying to sell you anything. They're not trying to do anything but make your life easier. So if it says it's a great thing and go ahead and do it, that's fine. And if it says it's not a smart buy, you know, or it's got a major problem, pay attention to it, you know. Uh, or it grows great in Miami, it. or it grows great up in the Panhandle. We're in Central Florida, so you have to make sure it grows great in your neighborhood. Right, yes. And the shame of the, the palms is our wonderful state native palm, um, the cabbage palm, or the sable palm. It has a disease too. So that's, you know, that's, yep. and it's a pretty, you know, virulent disease right now. The, what, what is its name now, Bill? It is lethal bronzing. Lethal bronzing. It used to we be Texas Phoenix. Palm yeah, Tex decline, yeah. 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 We palm see decline. it most often, not so much on cabbage palms, but they're, I mean, they're in landscapes, but not, they're not the most common landscape palm. See it a lot on Sylvester palms mm -hmm. and uh, Canary Island date palms. A lot here in Hernando County. And it's going to get worse within the state of Florida before it gets better. They are obviously with citrus greening and palm diseases, they put a lot of time and effort and energy into researching and figuring out the disease, coming up with a solution a cure, a management program, and they're getting closer with bronzing. They've discovered um, if a palm tree gets bronzing, it gives off chemical cues to other palm trees around it, and they build up their defenses to protect against it. So they have no cure for it, right? If you, you know, I'll be honest with you, in my front yard, I have several Sylvester palms, one of them is stone cold dead. I need to go out there and take pictures because it's really dead and it's going to have to come down because it got lethal bronzing. The big one right out front, bronzing came to visit my household and mm. took my palm from me. See, it even there, happens. There no solution. There's no. It even happens to Dr. Bill. Exactly. Yeah, I need and, to start documenting and there's all nothing the you disasters can, that happened to me. And there's nothing you can do about it. Except nope. take it down. Well, what what about the pre-treatment where uh, you you inject into the the palm? Is that really effective? They did. They do not say that it is one hundred percent effective. It's effective, but there's no guarantee. So if you have a palm tree that's susceptible, and uh, the entire list of palms that can get it is online if you look up, you know, University of Florida lethal bronzing. And if you're concerned about, because a lot of people have a very, very large, very old, very valuable palm trees, and they don't mm -hmm. want to just cross their fingers and hope for the best. You can get it tested, so you can drill out a sample of the tree and send it off to see if it has lethal bronzing or not. If it comes back that it does not have it, believe it or not, you can give your palm tree an injection a couple times a year with an antibiotic. It's not like a syringe that you may have seen before. It's a big metal syringe and a big metal needle because you're giving a palm tree a shot, basically. 
there's essentially nobody here in Hernando County that offers that service, though. You know, that's a, that entire kit is available uh, from several places. Amazon has uh, probably a dozen different setups to do that, and and the price is fairly reasonable. You know, if, mm -hmm. if I had a, a ten thousand dollar palm and it was going to cost me a uh, hundred dollars a year uh, for insurance on that palm uh, by treating it. I don't think that that would be too tough a decision there. There are, and, and once you set up to do it, the actual chemical, the, the, uh, liquid is, is fairly inexpensive. I mean, it's, uh, about it seven or $8 a year per tree for the, uh, antibacterial disease or uh, treatment yeah i've looked that up before and um i'm probably going to order a set and get my other sylvester palms tested so if they if any of them come back negative i'm going to get the set to start giving them injections but before people start emailing me about where who can i call to come out and do that believe it or not nobody here really is set up to do that commercially. Now, I know people within your university system who are not in favor of the use of antibiotics for plants. How do you feel it's about one that? that? I don't think is, you would use for human use. It's oxytetracycline or OTC. We use tetracycline, obviously, for humans. So you can make the argument about overuse of antibiotics is not mm -hmm. a good idea. Mm -hmm. I don't see it being overused right now. <laughs> Matter of fact, I see it being really underused. I I only know really of I only know of one person who's getting the injections in her trees. And how are they prohibitively expensive for a homeowner just with a tree in their yard? No, it's cheap. <laughs> it's cheap. And it would be a um, wonderful business opportunity for somebody to offer that service. Obviously, because the one lady I know who gets the injection, she's an older woman. She lives in Wellington. And she, you know, it would be difficult for her to go out there and bang a metal syringe into the palm tree and give it an injection. Right. And she's happy to pay somebody to do it. So. Yeah, you can yeah. get these little neat or little nozzles that you permanently implant in a tree and uh, go in with a, 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 a uh, like a mammoth syringe and, and it's only like a dollar and a half worth of OTC. Uh, yep. it, it's really inexpensive. It's It's got to be cheaper than aspirin in, in the overall uh, drug industry. It, it, it's amazing how, how inexpensive it is. And it really isn't one of those things where it's ending up in the drinking water and, and uh, you know, it, it might if, if everybody treated every tree, but it, it's not something that's showing up. Apparently the trees uh, pretty well maintain this chemical until it is uh, dispersed in the tree. And like I said, there's no guarantee it's going to work, but it has shown that it works at least a good part of the time. Okay. So, so you're hey suggesting guys, that palm trees get the jab. That's what you're... <laughs> exactly. With a, <laughs> yeah. with a big needle. So if anybody watching us live has any lawn and garden questions, please go ahead and put them in the comments. The comments look kind of lonely and empty. Yeah. Teresa should be standing by to she really is. quickly Google that fact sheet and put the link up in the comments also, and then I'll show it. So how come then we can't inoculate the citrus trees for those problems? We don't have anything that we know is effective at, at this point. They have not come up with a cure. It's, it's very, very sad. It, uh, and, and we've got, uh, one entire branch of the university, uh, the, the citrus group has been working on this for several years now. And, uh, the, the best we've got is a variety that is tolerant. So, uh, 
We, and we have a found variety that uh, uh, are immune. We don't have anything where we can start cloning. And uh, uh, one of the things that is very bad is this this bacteria really doesn't grow well in culture. So uh, you you have to work with live trees. Uh, and and when the trees fouled up and gone, then you're done with that one. We got to start with another tree and, and do our work on the next tree. So most things, uh, they put it in a petri dish and, and uh, grow it, and and they can discover something that works, and and you can go from there. Well, this this doesn't grow in a petri dish. Well, and considering going back to citrus, you know, it's not a native plant by any means. So considering it had a good run for how many hundreds of years <laughs> did it do well you know the spanish brought it over so yeah, it, it was a, a 250 year crop here of, of major importance and uh, and like i say this, this is the the worst year in 100 years and and it's really sad because uh if, if the industry goes uh because it's going to raise the price of, of orange juice, it's going to reduce the number of customers. So it's going to reduce the demand and it's going to end up kind of self driving itself to the ground and, and it, it's bad now and it's going to get worse. So we, we don't really have any good answers. Uh, so and, the, and you know, it, the but, lesson there is don't put all your oranges in one basket, you know, and when you, anytime you have massive amounts of the same plant, you're opening yourself up for destruction of that plant because there's no diversity there. There's nothing. I mean, so a pathogen exists. It, it's a total wipeout. Texas is a happen. major a grower of citrus. Texas is, is very, very, very big. And I'm not, I don't know if Texas has greening problems or not. But if, if we lose Texas as, as a, a producer, we're going to be in very, very serious shape uh, as having citrus for sale. It means we're going to end up buying our citrus from other places. Can we talk about Brazil? <laughs> okay, we got a question from Anne Marie. And we'll toss this one over to Bernie. She wants to talk about lichens on older fruit trees. Should she cut her fruit trees down? Uh, it's been on her mind for a while. So she has white lichen, like on the three oldest trees, an orange and peach. Had so much fruit last year from healthy trees, lots froze. So, so what's with lichens and stuff growing on trees? Do we need to rush out there and cut them down with a chainsaw? No, absolutely not. Um, lichens are. Uh, uh, symbiotic relationship between a fungus and an algae. Uh, they do not consume anything from the plant other than uh, using it for a structure to hold it. So uh, they don't do anything wrong at all. But on a peach tree, peaches in Florida have a relatively short life. Uh, trees live maybe 10, 12 years. Uh, the, the bark gets all crunkly. Uh, the lichens have lots and lots of surface to grow on. They, it looks like the lichens have taken over uh, the, the plant. Well, the truth is, the lichens are just there. And the plant itself is, is going to pot in such a hurry that the lichens don't realize they shouldn't keep being there, that, that the tree's going to die and they're not going to have any place to hang on to. But the lichens do not, absolutely do not contribute to the demise of the trees. The lichens do not take anything from the tree. They're just sitting there. Uh, you know, lichens and, and ball moss and, and those Spanish moss, all those things grow on telephone lines. If, if you've noticed, mm -hmm. uh, it, they don't grow on the copper wires. It's an interesting thing that those, those plants don't like copper. So 
Well, because no moss, copper. yeah, no moss likes copper. <laughs> That's, That's right. So if, if you have a copper wire, you, you don't get all the lichens and things. But when you look at the telephone poles or the, the power poles, power wires which have copper don't have anything. The, the phone lines and, and the uh, cable TV lines and those things have lichens and ball moss and Spanish moss and all those things growing on. They do not hurt anything. They get blamed for everything. Uh, Spanish moss does, in, in weakened plants, become uh, a little too much and that it, it uh, tends to slow down the photosynthesis of the plant and since the plant's already weakened, it, it does hasten the demise. I won't say that there's never any damage from Spanish moss. Mechanical, mechanical from shading yeah. it out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and it but, does add weight to the branch and could, if you have especially dead branches, the weight of Spanish moss on them could cause them to break and come tumble. So just pick it off. Would, would yeah. manure feed the moss if you wanted it to grow? No. Here's, here's an I'm interesting I'm not sure how you thing. get the manure up there. Uh, these are they may be talking they, about they green. They basically get everything they need from the air. And generally, if you have these things, it's an indication you have good air quality. So uh, if, if you have an area with, with uh, poor air quality, sulfur in the air or those kind of things, you generally don't have the lichens and the mosses. Uh, Especially the pink, the pink lichen on the trees, if you see that in the woods that will not grow um, where there's bad air quality. The, the pink lichen, the, the one we call Christmas moss, right. I think is, is probably one of the, the prettiest. If, if, if that is given ideal conditions, it, it forms a beautiful pink circle and it kind of flares out. Uh, and then it has a darker ring around the outside. It, it looks Kind of like somebody painted a bullseye on the trees, but yeah, it, if you it, got it, hiking it, in the woods, you'll find that. So yeah, that, well, that's I'll very hike. nice. So mm -hmm. uh, love lichens. So we got a question about. I assume what am I planting this week? That's from Corey. I'm, I'm not planting anything. The only thing I have going in the garden is sweet potatoes, the orange bulldog pumpkins, which are doing beautifully. They haven't really taken off and started running all over yet but they do have very large leaves healthy plants and some seminole pumpkins which i've never tried growing before and they will just be allowed to go wherever they want in the backyard until probably i'm not really going to put much in until september or october so both me and the garden are taking a little bit of time off i guess So do those pumpkins, do, would they attract these squash bees? Yes, <laughs> but the squash bee technically is only out for a short period of time. And I'm not sure when it's adult season is and how that coincides with mine when they're flowering. Oh, okay. It is, is isn't it? It's pollinator week, I think, as I've seen on Facebook. So yes, what I have... Although I don't pay much attention to those this week, that week, the other week, because for us, you know, every week is pollinator week. Every week is native plant week. Every week is wildflower week. But to recognize pollinator week, I've been showing some of our old YouTubes or my old YouTubes I've been putting up on Facebook, you know, where yeah. we're talking about attracting pollinators to our yards. The biggest thing you want pollinators, stop spraying pesticides. That really is the. If you're spraying a lot of pesticides and you have a service that comes with that big, big garden hose and just starts hosing down your property, I don't know what you expect to come and live there after doing that. Yeah. Well, the bad thing about it is if there's any bad insect to, to show up after you've killed everything, there will be no good insect to keep it in check for a long yep. period of time. So the bad guys love having you spray for the and sure the good guys are the ones that uh you really lose the ones that you really need bill 
when when you get ready to prepare a garden what are you doing to the soil before you actually do the planting dig it up dig out the grass turn it over i constantly make compost and then when i have things actually growing i always mulch the heck out of them with grass clippings leaves whatever i find access to so a new garden takes a couple years before i really get much organic matter in there you can try growing things in just the raw sand so if you got in your backyard just dig up the grass and you there are things that you can plant they're going to do much better after you build up the organic matter um you'll find out very quickly if you have root non nematodes because your tomatoes and peppers and everything and beans will die pretty quickly um winter time things tend to grow better in just raw sand you can grow decent crop of lettuces, greens, radishes, things like that in pretty raw sand. But my garden is finally getting to the point where the organic matter contents kind of coming up and things grow better. Constant, constantly putting organic matter on the garden, in the garden, making compost, working in, let it break down. So the organic matter can also come from your first couple of crops of dead plants. <laughs> you can have those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all the circle. On, turn them under. <laughs> yes, it's the circle of life. So people, they may think there's absolutely no way you can grow anything in Florida soil. They haven't been to South Florida then <laughs> to see the... Well, they, have, they just have a totally different kind of soil. Well, they are too. Okay, but there are people here who they grow many crops, you know, and the old southerners have done it forever, but they have done like we we're talking about in the summer, if they were growing anything, they were growing black eyed peas, sweet potatoes, mm -hmm. and okra. And I don't, there's not a whole lot of enriching of the soil you have to do for those three things. No. And if you don't want to grow those, summer is a good time to grow a uh, cover crop, mm -hmm. which is something that you plant and grow you're not going to pick it. You're not going to eat it. You're not going to can it. When it grows, you're just going to turn it under. That plant is doing a couple things. It's taking up the free nutrient ions in the soil and holding them so they don't wash away in the summer rains. And you're growing the plant that you're going to chop up and turn over to add organic matter to your soil. So in the fall, when you plant your garden, you have more organic matter. And if you use a legumous type ground cover crop, it helps with the nitrogen, making it more readily available. Mm -hmm. Other things just add large amounts of organic matter. You can grow things to stay small. You can grow things that get like 10 feet tall. Sun hemp gets very, very tall. Boy, and you mentioned those nematodes. So that's another thing you can do in the summer is solarize your soil. Just put clear plastic out there and burn those little buggers in there. Pretty much. <laughs> it, it drives them away. And that way, when you plant things in the fall, you kind of have a free period where you're going to have very few of them. They'll come back. Nematodes move in the soil. Bad bacteria, you know, you can't sanitize the great outdoors. It's going to come back. But solarizing kind of gives you a window where all those things are gone, at least temporarily. It helps. Do you like a rototiller? For, is that a good idea to use a rototiller? It doesn't hurt, especially when you're starting your garden or the first couple seasons. I'm going much more towards no-till. Trying to just kind of pile up the organic matter. Now that I have a good amount in the top foot, foot and a half, however deep my shovel goes and I dig, I'm just going to stick more with no-till which is not tilling up your garden, just putting the organic matter there and letting it pile up and pile up and pile up and planting in that. So would you consider trench composting um, to create a garden bed? I kind of do that because in my walkways, I take those cardboard boxes that Amazon stuff comes in, cut them up, put them out there to block the weeds and then throw grass clippings and leaves and organic matter on top of them do that a couple times and now you basically have compost in your walkways every couple years you can take everything that's there 
flip it up onto the beds and start from bare dirt down there once again. So I compost in a compost bin. I take grass clippings and just mulch with that. That's more sheet composting, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can take only partly finished compost and either put it on the soil, work it in the top couple inches. You don't have to wait for long here in Florida for it to finish up. Right. Things decompose very, very quickly here. So you can do that, wait maybe a month, and you're good to plant. Do you have any bunny issues or any other? Not in the backyard, but we do in my front yard. And, you know, they love my freedom lawn. <laughs> I got stuff growing out there that they just love to come by and eat at night. The population goes up where I can walk out front to take the trash out at night and I see a couple of them. And then I don't see any of them at all for months. So, but they don't bother your garden? No. Huh. Maybe because you have that freedom law and you're giving them frog fruit and <laughs> all the kind of good stuff to eat. Yeah, you know and we he... have a neighborhood gopher tortoise that when he cruises through my yard, he stops and starts eating a whole bunch of different things. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure what, but I have things out there that they like to eat also. Well, they love prickly you know pear. Yep. When you have a lot of rabbits, that you hear coyotes? Oh, yeah. Oh, we, we're in Spring Hill. We have coyotes. We all have coyotes in Fernando County. They're around. Yep, yep, yeah, the gopher tortoises, well, they like gopher apple. They like prickly pear. I have found from personal experience that they love passion vine because it wouldn't let mine grow. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> he'll get six inches tall and he'd come over and chop it off <laughs> so. yeah lee yeah. is in south florida so they have that coral um soil sand corals um a lot of limestone i'm not but sure what lee's ph would be but just a bit further south down around homestead everybody 8.5 Okay, but if you move further inland, it's 8.5. If you move further inland where they have dried up the Everglades, then you're on muck. That's and different. They have, they have fabulous <laughs> soil. Yep. She composts directly in the garden and on cardboard. So you said you could put half composted stuff in there. I'm thinking banana peels and stuff. Is that going to attract um, varmints of any kind? Yeah, putting a lot of um, just raw kitchen scraps out there, throwing them on the ground, it's going to attract animals. Animals will find it and eat it. So all that stuff goes in the compost bin, and I get it at least partly composted. After a certain point, the material is still a little bit recognizable, but not completely. Mm -hmm. At that point, you can spread it, turn it under a little bit. And of course, if you beforehand, you know, that, that goes back to the kitchen. Um, if you chopping it up into small bits to begin with, mm -hmm. that helps whether you're putting it in your bin or your garden or wherever. So. And mixing in a carbon source, shredded paper, shredded leaves, whatever you might have access to helps to get it at least partly composted. So if you have documents you want to hide, shredding and composting to <laughs> help your garden grow. Yep. Yeah. Shred them and put them in the compost bin. There you go. You're probably pretty safe. So hey guys, anybody watching has any questions, comments? She puts chicken wire around her garden. Uh, Lee does. I guess to ward off the bunnies. That helps deter a lot of things. Rabbits, neighborhood cats. Armadillos. Armadillos. Yeah. We have serious problems with armadillos. Mm -hmm. I have raccoons in the neighborhood also. Yep. Um, I got a question yesterday. Somebody left me a voice message. I have emailed them. But wanting to know, she heard, I love this when it starts this way, she heard that Hernando County Utilities will give her a um, 
rebate if she puts down artificial turf in her yard. That's a great deal. I'll have to call. I'll have to call you about that. <laughs> to my knowledge, we're not offering any landscape swap rebates at this time. There was, you know, if that's going to happen, we're going to target a specific community and encourage that community to go to Bahia grass as compared to St. Augustine, most likely. So I had to explain to her, you know, as far as I know, there's nothing like that happening, but here are our rebates we do offer. But by the way, artificial turf or all rock gardens would never be part of a rebate system because they're not considered Florida friendly. And, you know, I understand where the frustration is coming from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When but, you have turf grass problems, I spoke to that couple who did their entire front yard in landscape rocks. I don't know if they ever contacted you. I, I, I pointed them in your direction. What do iguanas really like? What, what do they eat? Any kind of fruit and vegetable matter. I've known people years ago that had them as pets, and you throw kitchen scraps in there. Whatever you feed them, they'll eat, and they get bigger. So the more you feed them, the bigger they'll get. So they're omnivores. Mm -hmm. um, Lori is asking what a freedom garden is. I think he, he said freedom lawn. What a freedom yeah. Yeah. What is a freedom lawn? He was referring to his front yard and that's where the bunnies like to eat. And that is distracting them from his vegetable garden. A freedom lawn is just grass that grows. However, it grows and you don't fuss over it. <laughs> so what Bill has is Bahia grass. And you were saying because of the summer rains in the summer, the Bahia grass, there's more percentage of that. <laughs> Than the wheat. It does great. It has just sucked up all the recent rains we've gotten and it's growing like crazy. Yeah. So he doesn't sit there and worry that, oh my gosh, there's weeds all in my lawn. So no. I don't know, fertilize. Will you, I don't... It, will you leave the uh, seed head so that uh, it reseeds or do you overseed or any of those other things? No, I have not had a chance to overseed. Hey, AFC is really expensive. So I'm kind but of, it's expensive, yeah. I haven't been in a rush to go out and buy a bag of seed. About um, Yeah, I took Bernie's advice, and he has good advice that with the Bahia grass, you know, out in the savanna, um, it's going to go to seed. Yeah. Where the animals are going to eat the seed and spread the seed. And yeah, we, that's what happens know, in pastures. Yeah, we, yeah, and we cut it down before that. So he suggests every two, three years, to overseed to kind of make up for what we're not allowing to happen. And uh, like two, three years, I think it was during COVID. Yeah. So about three years ago, um, I did that to the front yard. And you know, first time in like 12 years, <laughs> I've done anything to this yard. I overseeded with Bah the Bahia grass on the Bahia grass and weed lawn. Um, in the summer, it was raining. And then we also sprinkle down some black cow. That made a wonderful looking lawn. I mean, pretty much, you know, within a month or so it looked yep. and, and held on to that, you know, looking really good like that for quite some time. So it was a good move, but I only did that front yard because a 10 pound bag of Bahia seed was $70. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's a little pricey. But it does help to have to purchase Bahia seed and just throw some handfuls out there during the rainy season. Every summer, it will thicken up your Bahia lawn. And there's at least a couple times where either it's a combination of I allow or I just don't get to cutting the lawn quick enough so that the seed heads all come up. So the Bahia grass is naturally making some free seeds for me to help thicken up that grass. Yeah. Really so those, those peace sign seed heads, those, 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 those are viable seeds. Not every single one yep. of them, yep. but yeah, you know, they will help if you leave them alone. As the, much as you when, hate when you seed from your $70 package, if you get 15% germination, that's fantastic. That, mm -hmm. that yeah, it naturally has low germination. The poorest germination rate per buck of anything you could throw out. 
Yeah. And so, you know, allowing the weeds in there, that's what the bunnies are eating, that turkey tangle fog fruit, <laughs> as well as you can have Florida pusley, you can have um, purslane, you know, a portulaca in there. You know, if you're in an area that doesn't send you nasty grams, <laughs> when you have that, that's that's the way to go. And yeah. my, you know, lawns that I've had look fantastic in the summer. They don't look that great in the winter, you know, but neither do does a fuss over St. Augustine lawn. You know, we've got Mimosa strigulosa and, and right now with the Bahia sticking up and, and being nice and tall and, and the little puff balls all over the yard. I like that look. Now there's a lot of people probably couldn't stand it, but yeah, yeah you I like a meadow see. kind of look. And it's mm -hmm. a beautiful uniform lawn in, in that respect. And you live out in the country, so no one's going to bother you about that, too. So you do have to take that into consideration. And it comes down to what your goals are. Mm -hmm. As the master gardeners always say, green, most of the year green, mowable, looks good at 30 miles an hour as someone's driving past or from 30 feet away. Mm -hmm. 30, 30 long, yeah. That's so a freedom <laughs> with i guess the gopher tortoises yes they like passion vine and lettuce and sweet potato vines i could plant some sweet potato vines in my front yard there you go and you know if the gopher tortoises eat them that's fine that's great give them something to chew on when they're walk marching through my yard yeah three o'clock every afternoon between three and four is when they the absolute hottest part of the day is when they're like, ooh, time to go outside. It's nice out now. <laughs> yeah, I mowed Tuesday and found three new gopher tortoise burrows in my front yard. Little, little ones. So I, I got some babies out there running around. I've, I've got five acres and probably 15 gopher tortoises on five acres. Nice. They, they, they're everywhere, and I really don't mind it. No. Uh, when they quit using a burrow, you put the sand back in the hole and level it off a little bit. And they, they have the fewer and fewer years, places to go. They, they make a big burrow and then abandon it really quick. You know, if, if it's, they're going to be there for two or three years, that's great. If they're only going to be there for a month, I wish they hadn't made such a big hole. <laughs> Make them sign a lease, Bernie. Yeah. <laughs> or ought to post a sign. Put it down low so they can read it. Normal amount of times, Lori. <laughs> you know. As needed. Yes. Right now, it's going to be needed more often. Mine's going to need it definitely once a week, especially if it keeps raining like this. And at the moment, I see it's nice and sunny outside. Gosh, during the winter, I can go months without oh, yeah. having to cut it. Oh, yeah. Easy. Well, to give you an idea, I mow my yard eight times a year. Wow. Wow. I, I have a little space that I mow probably another 10 times because it's a walkway and it's where we park the cars. But the actual yard itself, uh, only gets mowed eight times a year. When it looks bad, when I, I come around the corner, I think, God, it looks bad. I got to mow it. It gets it. Other than that, I'll leave it alone. As long as it looks uniform and green, that's it. That's fine. Yeah. And there's, that is providing so much wildlife value doing that. But obviously then you're not having, you have the Bahia and the Sunshine Mimosa. Do you have issues with invasive plants also getting in there? I, I found that they go down in number instead of up in number. Uh, I, I almost never have to do anything except for the one plant that I despise where I, I go out and, and pull them occasionally. The Biden's Alba. Just... <laughs> Those are not invasive plants. Those are native. Oh, it isn't? No. It's weedy. <laughs> I think that's Teresa's favorite plant. Yes. Pollinators love those plants. 
they do. Yes. Every pollinator, every bee and fly and butterfly and big ones and little ones, everything. Mm -hmm. The only thing that flowers that I, I don't leave alone. You should. <laughs> yeah, and that's something if you have a butterfly garden, you should definitely have and keep. Well, I can understand there. that area that you mow, where it's a walkway and where your dogs go out because you don't want your dogs dragging in all their stickers and stuff. But everywhere else, let it let it be. Let it be. <laughs> but it is so invasive. It's so aggressive. Oh, yeah. It's invasive. But it is really aggressive. So I, I started out, I did let it be. And and this year you got six plants. And next year you got 36. And the next year you got 156. <laughs> and uh, that, that's just too aggressive for me. Okay. Well, yeah, because each little flower makes up a whole bunch of seeds. Yes. Yeah, so if you let so it go and make agree seed, to maintain it, and you know, not necessarily try to eradicate it. You have <laughs> to mow more often if if you get a lot of it because it, it goes into places that where it looks bad. Yeah, yeah. So it's easier to just not have it. Yeah. As long as you're not replacing it with, you know, Mexican petunia or... I like Mexican petunia. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't planted any. I, I, I went through all about uh, 12 years ago, maybe even longer than that. It was when Kariki was uh, doing your job and I got my yard Florida certified and I had to take out the... Uh, bad things that I had planted. I had planted a bunch of bad things. So it, 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 that's what people do. You, you come to Florida, you have no comprehension of what these plants are. You go to the big box store and here's something that's beautiful and you take it home and you plant it and, and you have no idea that it's one of the most invasive things going. So next year you go back and you buy some more things and they're only half as invasive, but they're all beautiful. You know, it, it's we do, the, the native things are not only the thing that you can put in that's beautiful. And there really is nothing wrong with using non-natives if, if you're wise about what you put in. You know, a, a, a few flowers here, a few flowers there. If you're doing legitimate landscaping uh, and, and you've got natives where natives are appropriate, and that's the book, yes. That, that is the Bible. And those are free. The mm -hmm. price is right. This um, is Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design. But it, it's amazing what you can buy where you shouldn't be able to. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. You know, it, it, go back to the citrus thing. I, I, I went to one of the big box stores and, and uh, northern north of here. And they had lemon trees and lime trees. And and lemon and lime shouldn't even be planted here. For the most part, this is too far north. The the next area farther north is, is even worse than we are. Mm -hmm. And I asked them, do, are, do these plants actually do well here? Oh, yes, they do fantastic. Well, <laughs> you know, the, the big we saw a bunch. Store, they must do well. A lot of million lime trees. And they're selling them in every store in Florida. You probably buy them up in the panhandle. The, the first frost, those little lime trees are zapped, and they weren't cheap. I, right. I bought one of each and, and put them in pots. But um, for somebody that thinks they're going to take that home and stick it in the ground, uh, there again, you know, when you're, when you're new here, you make a lot of mistakes. And it's kind of sad because... That, that same money spent on things that would really be satisfactory. One, would put your head on, on beautiful landscaping. And second, would save you a lot of money that you could use to spend on things like coming to uh, Master Gardener training. and, and <laughs> like Yes. Um, the, you're the third person I've heard talk about. They're night blooming serious. They are very happy right now. That you do have to be up in the middle of the night <laughs> to catch the blooms. Yes, they flower at night. Yes. Um, 
So, or you can watch someone on Facebook who takes pictures of their night blooming series who stays up at night to watch them. And literally by the next morning, they're like, you know, they were like beautiful mm -hmm. at midnight. And then by next morning. So if you weren't up to watch it, this you're going to see just droopy, like we're done. We're children of the night flowers. But yeah, that night blooming series is what's happening right now. So... And Pamela asks, why aren't plant sales controlled at big oh, box stores? Oh, that's a big question. And we're, uh, <laughs> I'll try and finish it up. Okay. Um, well, see, plants end up in different categories. Um, and some of them are on uh, federal, they get declared a federal noxious plant. And that regulates the sale, you know, and transport and... Um, of these plants and they are not allowed to be sold. Sometimes that can be done on the state level because what's, um, you know, a noxious plant in Florida may not be a noxious plant in Ohio. So the, and so those are on very specific lists where nurseries are not allowed to sell them, but there's a whole bunch of other plants that have, because they are not necessarily yet proven to be a problem for farmers, for crops, are a problem for public health. That is what your, your main two things, you know, that get considered to be considered a noxious plant. If they are inhibiting agriculture or even the nursery trade, you know, um, then they get on these lists. So there's a bunch of other plants that have not made it onto that list yet, but there is a watchdog group that is called the, they've changed their name to Florida Invasive um, Species Council. It used to be FLEPSI, Florida, mm -hmm. you know, Invasive Plant, Pest Plant Species Council. Now it's just Florida Invasive Species Council. So they are a watchdog group. They take all these other plants that haven't made it onto those law <laughs> lists yet, that, you know, and they're like, we're watching you. We are watching you. Mexican petunia, we're watching you, but because they haven't yet, um, you know, or the research hasn't been done or whatever, um, proven to be a economic problem, really, <laughs> you know, and sometimes public health problem. Therefore, they haven't made it on the do not sell list. I hope that answers your question. So, yes, there is a short federal list and a short state list of prohibited plants. There's a lot of other things that we don't recommend growing and they are pretty much invasive, but they're not, there's no regulations against them. So nurseries could sell them. Well, a lot of times, uh, uh, you know, the big boxes have no idea what you're going to do with the plant. When, when I bought the lemon and the lime tree with the intent of putting them in pots, they, they have no, idea that, uh, that how the plant's going to be treated. They have no idea where the plant's going to be. You know, somebody from Sarasota could have bought it mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. taken it back to Sarasota. And those are two different issues that so, we were just so they, discussing. They have a right to sell all those plants. You have a right to buy them. The thing about it is the, the mistake is made when you don't explain that this plant will not be happy in Hernando County. You, you can buy it, you can plant it, you can enjoy it. In six months, it's over. It will not grow back. It's not like it is in South Florida, or it's not like it is when you plant it in Indiana. This will be gone in six months. If you know that, and you still want to spend $45 for this beautiful plant, mm -hmm. that's fine. I have no objection to the big box stores selling the variety. In fact, I would be upset if they didn't. But I do object to the fact that they sell them without the information that the people need uh, to to right. And so there, those are two different issues. Decision on whether they want to buy it or what they want to do with it. So we have they can sell plants that could be invasive because no one's stopping them, and they can sell plants that may or may not be right for that particular area. It doesn't mean that they're invasive, like the lemon and lime trees. Yeah. So the answer is educate yourself. That's why you're here. That's why I keep saying, don't get so excited and buy the plant. If, if you really like it, 
educate yourself before you spend the money. Either that, or don't come in here on on Thursday afternoon and, and cry about I just spent one hundred and fifty dollars for this thing, and and it didn't survive the winter. Well, it isn't supposed to survive the winter, you know. Right. And and it was really your fault. So, of course, I can't tell. And when you that, think but. in. <laughs> What you're making me think of, Bernie, is, you know, if you make the decision to enjoy it, knowing it's a short time thing, and you mentioned $45, you're going to spend 100 or more on a nice cut flower arrangement that you know is only going to last a week. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, just kind of look at it that way. I know this is a short time thing, and I am willing to pay X amount for that short time enjoyment. Where, where it becomes a, a serious problem, I think, is, is the newcomer comes to Florida and, and wants to do a, a landscape that they really enjoy. So they go to the, the big box store and they buy plants that are pretty and they, they put them in places that are fine, but the whole landscape is not a Hernando County landscape. It, it's the the right plant in the wrong place. And and that's the education problem. And nobody wants to take the education. And we're here. We're free. We'll do whatever we can for people. And and how do we get that message out? How do how do people get educated? The poor guy that, that moves here from New Jersey and has never done any gardening is at a terrible loss when they go to buy plants. That the nursery will sell them whatever they want to buy. The big box store will sell them whatever they want to buy. I mean, that's the industry. That's the way it should be. But the, the, the people need to get the education. And, and until we can do something about the education, it, it's always going to be a problem. We're going to have this, uh, the plants that, that don't survive and the, the plants that are a problem. You know, if, if, if you move here from New Jersey and you want to go out and buy a palm tree, you will go out and immediately buy a palm tree if you want one in your new yard. And nobody is going to tell you that there is a disease of that particular palm tree that may kill your foot. In, in a lot of instances, a $2,000 decision. Yeah. And, and your neighbor's got one. So if your neighbor's got the exact same thing, why would it be a problem for me? Well, Where's, where's the owner's manual that tells you about all those things when you when you move to Florida? I think when you get your Florida driver's license, you ought to have to get a copy of that book. <laughs> yes. There you go. That, that's my uh, soapbox for today. And Lori, we go ahead and give all of our advice and information and everything for free. So whatever county you live in, you're going to have a county extension office. You can contact them, find out about free classes they give um the the book that lily held up we give that away for free uh you can call the office and talk to bernie later on today or swing by and bring a leaf or a bug or a branch or whatever it might be um a lot of people will come in and they just have a whole bunch of pictures on their phone we can work with that you can email us pictures we can work with that a lot of times a simple like insect identification or problem solution if you just take a couple pictures with your phone and send them to us we can work with that and answer it if it's something that we need to see look at under microscope we'll tell you that you know we'll help you figure it out one more wait one more question <laughs> we're fighting over this again <laughs> I um, got it. oh i got it there we go <laughs> I think I, I said night blooming serious, but if you're talking about a red fruit, sounds like she's talking about a dragon fruit, which also has a big white flower. There's a whole bunch of different flowering cacti. They're all hedge cacti, which means the, um, now there's some flat paddle ones also. There's a lot of different cacti or cactuses that flower at night in Florida. The most common ones are the ones where the, the plant looks almost like it's square, like a four by four or two by two or whatever. And that and it grows bigger and bigger, gets a large flower and will get a fruit afterwards. Some of them 
none of them are dangerous. None of them are poisonous. Some of them are going to taste nasty. Other ones, you can go to a um, Hispanic grocery store and buy it. So what, whether or not it's going to, that the fruit from that is going to taste very good or not, I really can't tell you. So there yeah. is night, night blooming cereus and a number of other species of hedge cacti. That's the group that they're in, the flower. Oh, and theirs does not have a paddle. A paddle is the, the flat mm -hmm. part of a cactus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if it's more of a um, square branch or yeah, part yeah. that's growing upwards. Col col columnar. <laughs> yeah, uh, hedge cactus. Okay. And there's a bunch. There's and a some of them like the plant use uh, like oak trees and stuff for support too. Yeah, um, dragon fruit do naturally grow up through trees. If you let them do that, they will get very, very, very tall. And now you have flowers and fruit, but they're way <laughs> up there and you're going to have a problem getting them down. So people will grow them on a trellis. They're easier to to get to and manage that way. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure um, exactly what type of cactus they have. There's a Maybe lot. Take of a picture and send it to your email. Sure. Yep. All right. Well, it's eleven eleven. Okay. I don't see any other questions on here. Just a handful of thank yous. Y'all are very welcome. Yes. Thank you for coming every week to listen to us. Because you know what? We would be having these conversations whether, us, whether the rest of you were here or not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great to have you join us. <laughs> And I will be back here again next Thursday at 10 a.m. Lily, will you? I will. What is this, the 21st? So that's the 28th? Today's the no, 29th. Today's the 22nd. I don't even yeah. know what day it is. The 29th? Yes, I will be here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bernie should be here. And Bernie told me today that we need to invite Leslie on, who's the new person in charge of the environmentally sensitive lands. And that sounds like a good idea. I will ask her. I will see her in person tomorrow at our mm -hmm. training. And Lily, I'll see you in person tomorrow also. Yes. Yes, I'll be there. So. Okay. We're going to play FFL bingo for your <laughs> new Master Gardener trainees. <laughs> so. Do you have anything to give away as a prize or do I need to bring prizes? Yeah, I don't have anything. So, yeah, bring 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 some prizes if you want them and Lori, yeah we have live chats here we have rainbow classes we have septics class we do all kinds of stuff here somebody needs to tell my boss about that one of you <laughs> okay well hey everybody thank you so much we're going to go ahead and wrap it up i believe all of us will be here again next thursday i will be here next thursday with a very special announcement with a special announcement, mm -hmm. special guests. Are we going to have cupcakes and pizza also? I mean, self-provided. I mean, everyone oh. <laughs> listening can, you yeah. know, eat whatever they want. <laughs> so. Okay, we'll be back with all kinds of fun stuff next Thursday at 10 a.m. here on our Facebook page, our Facebook group, and on YouTube also. And I see people watching live on all three of the above. So Bernie thanks for having me. Teresa or someone. There. Yeah, I've got a client waiting. Oh, okay. Well, okay, no problem. We'll see you later. Bye. All righty. Bye bye.